One of the keys to understanding modern human origins, this question of whether or not our species, Homo sapiens, is the result of a late Pleistocene speciation event giving rise to us, or whether or not our ancestry includes some aspect of those pre-Homo sapiens populations, like Neanderthals in Western Eurasia, or Denisovans in Eastern Asia, is to think about that relationship of geography and how it affects issues of speciation, issues of reproductive isolation, issues of how variation is structured within and between populations. This is a question that we've repeated again and again throughout this course. We brought it up in the context of thinking about the robust Australopithecines in Southern Africa and Eastern Africa. We thought about it when we first introduced the dispersal of Homo erectus outside of Africa. And we'll return to it now in thinking about modern human origins. And again, the question is, what happens as populations get isolated in geographic areas? And what are the factors that actually lead to that isolation? For example, if we think about the distribution of humans in the old world, some say, over the last 300,000 years, there are major centers of population occupation. Africa has always been at the center of our evolutionary history. For the vast majority of our evolutionary history, we've had the largest population in Africa, probably the most number of populations, and populations spanning a large geographic range within Africa. But at the same time, Africa has areas that also are more difficult to occupy and have affected the relationship between African populations and non-African populations. For example, if we think about the Sahara Desert occupying northern Africa here, at various times in the Pleistocene, it's become smaller or larger. If we think about periods where it expanded, part of what it was doing in that time period was creating a geographic block, basically an obstacle between populations in sub-Saharan Africa and the rest of the world. It would be difficult to navigate across the sub-Saharan Africa. And by navigate, I don't mean one population or one individual moving across the desert. Rather, I mean populations expanding in a continuous fashion across this region. Now, the coastal routes may have always been open, so there may have been some degree of accessibility across these coastal regions, but it may have been limited. So expansions of the Sahara may have constricted, basically, the development or the connections between sub-Saharan African populations and non-African populations. There are other geographic barriers that persisted at various times throughout the Pleistocene. For example, during periods of glaciation, much of northern Europe would have been covered with expanding glacial masses. During these periods, populations in Europe, things like the Neanderthals, for example, may have become isolated into small segments within southern Europe, places like Italy, places like the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, even Gibraltar, where Basically, a much larger population would have been condensed into a smaller area. As we move into Asia, during these glacial periods, we would also have an expansion in aridity, particularly in the area of Central Asia east of the Caspian Sea, essentially the development of large deserts here. And don't forget also that we have a very large mountain range, the Himalayan Plateau, occupying in this area as well. So another big barrier might have been Central Asia. If we look at this map, then, we can begin to see key areas of population development. Areas of East and Southeast Asia, areas of Western and Southern Europe, areas of Southern Africa, and then the center of it basically in the Levant, areas of the Eastern Mediterranean shore and the Middle East today, as sort of core regional populations throughout the Pleistocene. Now, in understanding what happens when these populations become more isolated, we need to put it into evolutionary terms. So one of the things that happens, for example, in Europe, as populations become more isolated within Southern Europe, is we might expect those populations simply to shrink in size. The former population which had occupied much of Western Europe suddenly occupies only a smaller fraction. Now, all of those people who lived there before can't live in this small area. So we would have expected some degree of population crash associated with this movement into a Southern European refugia. So that would have increased the strength of genetic drift. So one of the factors that we'd expect to see happen is during these periods of isolation, we might see an enhanced effect of drift. Now, the other thing that happens as these populations become isolated is the gene flow between them becomes reduced. So the connections between, say, European populations through the Levant into Southern Africa may be restricted during these periods of more expansive glacial periods. So we can then begin to think about limiting gene flow Increasing genetic drift is essentially increasing the amount of divergence between populations. The critical question to ask is, does this increase in genetic divergence lead to speciation? Is it sufficient to create reproductive isolation, the kind of reproductive isolation that goes along with the development of species barriers? So the other factor that we have to think about is what are the actual processes of divergence that are going on? Are they processes of divergence that might lend themselves to speciation? Or are they processes of divergence that are more cultural, 
Recall that by the time we have the late Pleistocene, we have fairly advanced cultural technology. Even in the later Neanderthals, we see the development of stone tool industries like the Chateau Peronian, which show fairly advanced cognitive abilities. The beginning of ornamental material cultures, things like beads and shells that have been pierced to create necklaces, the use of ochre as perhaps a coloring agent associated with symbolic representations, and we begin to see these things again in these pre-Homo sapiens populations. So part of what's happening, part of the divergence that's happening is probably culturally driven. So the adaptation as populations move into more restricted areas is in part driven by changes in behavior, not necessarily changes in the genetic makeup of these populations. So in terms of the degree of divergence, the degree of reproductive isolation that's occurring, it might be in part behavioral or cultural divergence, which again will limit the amount of reproductive isolation, limit the ability of species differences to take place. So part of what these recurrent processes of isolation and then subsequent expansion and integration might do is create cultural variation or behavioral variation that doesn't correspond to species variation. The fact that we have genetic evidence suggesting that Neanderthals did interbreed with modern humans when they expanded out of Africa would suggest that the degree of isolation they experienced was not sufficient to create reproductive barriers. They were still able to produce viable offspring when they reconnected as populations expanded out of Africa some 150,000 years ago. They met populations of Neanderthals expanding out of Western Eurasia and they were able to produce viable offspring. So they weren't at that point different species. They were quite different. They were certainly more different than any two populations of humans living today. So the amount of genetic divergence that existed between Neanderthals and emerging modern humans was greater than we'd expect to see in living human populations today, but not sufficient, it seems, to be true species, at least in the biological species concept, which we generally use in thinking about these issues. So the role of genetic isolation is important for thinking about the pattern of variation we see. But we have to put it in evolutionary terms and think about it also, what are humans doing? What is the niche that humans are occupying? And how does that affect how we interpret the action of these evolutionary forces? Certainly there was isolation occurring between these regional populations. But was that isolation sufficient to cause reproductive isolation? The kind of sustained reproductive isolation that we need to create true species differences, particularly in a complex, large-bodied mammal like late Pleistocene humans.